Hey everybody, this is Birch. I'm reading this article about pop culture products and uh, how they're go how they've been behaving in the marketplace over the last ten years. And the, the the theory of the article, the speculation, is that products based around pop culture, and in particular nostalgia pop culture, are about to drop. And what they mean by drop of is sell less, basically. Um, and and so the article does a good job of kind of walking through how uh, we you know there's different trends and certainly products go through different life cycles, and that uh, one of the the trends that we saw one of the cycles that we went through was the emergence and uh, po popularity of nostalgia as a product in and of itself. So this is uh, the example that was given there is you know a show like Stranger Things comes out and it's set back in the eighties. And it's filled with lots of memorabilia and things from the 80s that you're supposed to, you know, rem be, you know remember and, and all the rest. And that uh, Dungeons and Dragons in particular uh, really benefited from this nostalgia. People went out and were like, they watched the show and they're like, oh, I remember that when I was a kid. I'm going to go out and buy some Dungeons and Dragons shit, partly because it helps you feel younger. That's the nostalgia aspect of it. And partially because you like Stranger Things and so you want products based off, of, you know, that, that seem connected to that show in some way. And so you get this, this boost. And you've seen a number of different, uh, uh, different shows, different movies. Hollywood has really gone in on this. Uh, remember the 80s? And it, it, um, the article actually puts out a, a pretty interesting theory that I hadn't thought about. But it, but and they had the facts and numbers to back it up. Uh, this is on Forbes. If you want to go check it out, by the way, just look look under nostalgia product trends or or uh, pop culture product trends. I think. Anyway, uh, basically, it's saying that the nostalgia wave of products and pop culture was sinking uh, until COVID hit, and then it and it was a kind of on a natural decline. It it, it boosts. It went up. Kind of around 2008, 2014, it had this whole like growth of the market, and then uh, you know, and then COVID hit, and uh, suddenly it saw a boost of nostalgia products. And the article basically um, it it proposes two things. It proposes that number one, um, you know, more people were at home watching Netflix, and and Hollywood was catching up at that point, so you're seeing a lot more nostalgia shows. And number two, people are kind of reminiscent for a time when, you know, life wasn't shitty and uh, they could go outside and not have to wear a mask. And so there's a there's kind of this entire um, interesting uh, article about how the uh, the lifespan of nostalgia pop culture products uh, extended, basically went longer than, you know, it, it should have because of this this trend. So that's all fine. And uh, that's what that's well and good. So why am I bringing this up on a comic channel? Well, one of the products that they mentioned was comics. Now, I don't know that that's exactly fair. I don't think comics are, you know, exactly a you know, nostalgia pop culture, you know, product. I think comics are a number of things. Um, so I think lumping them into, into that bucket is not necessarily fair. And I think uh, hilariously, and that's not the right word, really, I think comics largely ignored the nostalgia trip where it would have been dead simple for them to do more. So imagine if, uh, for example, Marvel would have just put out a, uh, a comic with the kind of writing team and art team of Captain America back in the 80s, basically Grunwald and uh, what, who's that? Kieran Dreyer was doing it then? Um, Dwyer? Uh, I think, you know, well, you know, <laughs> Dreyer was still alive. Uh, you, you know, you get, get a writer who writes like Mark Grunwald, put out a Captain America book with that kind of those, those feels and, and go to town comics by and large. Um, I, I don't know. They didn't do as much nostalgia as what was really obvious considering they had a product to pull from. But anyway, the article mentions that comic books and it uses comics as kind of some of the argument of co the sales of comics boosted during COVID and now are falling. And it's one of the few, it caught my notice because uh, it's one of the few articles to actually mention that comics, not in, and not tying in scholastic YA graphic novels, in fact, the article makes mention of graphic novels uh, from uh, YA books and that kind of thing, are, are doing okay, or doing well. And it mentions it in the context almost to prove its point that, you know, the, the products that were not tapping into nostalgia, that were not trying to get those bucks, um, are still doing okay, but the ones that 
you know, that are not. So th I think the, the flaw in this article is basically that comics are, you know, a, a product of pop culture nostalgia. But it did get me thinking. Uh, how, how, you know, <laughs> comics has worked itself into a similar weird niche market. If you listen to this channel, you, you know what that is. It, it supplies product to the direct market, which in and of itself is a very limited market. It's one that has a, you know, a very small kind of audience that, that is connected to it. Its price point is abnormally high for the audience it's trying to reach. You know, we could, you, you've heard the argument from a number of different comic creators of we need to reach a new audience. That's why we're, that's why we're making Bla Spider-Man Black today. We've got to reach that new audience. That's all fine. Again, you can you, you know you can make whatever arguments you want, but one of the absolute most truest things that that comes out of this is that if you're trying to hit that new audience, you can't price it like the old collectors market, and that's what that's what comics have done. Uh, the the comics that are for sale coming in at four ninety five for twenty two pages of art, uh, it it's that product by its very nature is for a collector speculator market. It's actually, and that was kind of related to this article, a lot of the pop culture nostalgia stuff was selling like G.I. Joe toys. It used to cost three bucks for now $24 for largely the same thing, way beyond inflation. But you're basically not selling them to kids anymore. You're selling them to grown adults who have money who are trying to remember their childhood. And nostalgia tends to hit best from a marketplace perspective for people who are, you know, in their 40s, who have a lot of disposable income, who tend to be a little bit more affluent. That's who that's that's where the nostalgia products work the best. Um, you know, it, OK, so the flaw, as you can probably tell, or the connection you can probably tell is comics absolutely check that box. Comics are, in effect, that kind of product. They're highly overpriced. They're sold in specialty, specialty stores. The specialness around them tends to be incentive gimmicks along the lines of a, uh, you know, a, a variant cover or a bagged in trading card. They're not doing that as much now, but I saw some comics coming out next year that or this year, I guess now, uh, that do. But anyway, comics are, are appealing to that market. And, but when you hear people talk about, you know, getting to that new audience, that new audience cannot afford that price point. If you truly wanted to pull in new readers via kind of Miles Morales and some of these new characters, you, you're going to need to charge an entry level price. You can't charge a guy in their 40s who's a comic collector price. But that's what comics have done. And so it the the whole but but if this article is true and that we're nearing the end of the bubble of nostalgia products and everything else i you know it it basically spells a moment for comics where a reckoning is here that basically comes along the lines of you're going to have to make a choice of you know strong appealing to the audience you have which is uh, not the audience you want but the audience you actually have or letting go and fully embracing the new market, but then you're going to have to start over with your business model, with your incentives, with all the rest. I think, uh, you know, and, and by the way, a lot of people talk about comics and are they good, are they bad, are they worse now, etc. Are we in the worst age, everything else? Um, in some ways, what you're seeing is just kind of this horrible divorce that's occurring. And the divorce is that as you're getting older, Comics are less interesting to you because they're no longer able to scratch the itch that, you know, they scratched back in the 80s and 90s. They're, they're not even trying to anymore. If the comics actually tried to, they might be able to. It would be difficult, but, you know, they, they, you know, they're not trying. Comics are kind of have one foot in the let's go find a new audience. And by the way, we're running out of money, so we can't afford as much for art and writing. Um, and we're flailing around like a fish that's been pulled out on the shore and it's just flopping until you finally put it out of its misery. It's flopping around like that, desperately trying to figure out what to do. Does it appeal to the new market? New market isn't here. 
New market can't afford the book. Not it's not sold where the new market is. So instead, it's trying to kind of you know timidly appeal to the uh, to the old market. But the old market's like you, you no longer resemble the thing I used to collect. So I don't want to buy you either. And that's that's the horrible place comics finds itself in. By the way, I guess I I just to conclude all this out. Um, don't you find it a little crazy? I, I I continually find it nuts that Marvel can print. 80 books a month plus and cannot figure out with 80 comics a month to appeal to both. The, the weird part is they try and appeal to both groups and, and kind of fail at both, but they, they kind of try and, and appeal to both in the same comic. What's to stop Marvel from saying, Hey guys, we're going to divide ourselves in half. We're going to have SmackDown and raw. We're going to have, <laughs> we're going to have a brand split. 40 books are going to go over this group. Your goal is to make content and make products that the, uh, you know, the thirties and 40 year olds, the ones who are spending those nostalgia bucks, the ones who are okay spending four ninety five, but they want a certain type of content. You just make those people happy. You've got 40 books a month to do it. Just make that group as happy as humanly possible. You do what they want. That's our uh, cash cow at the moment. Then you, you and uh, brand number two, you guys, your goal is to get those new readers. So go out there. You got 40 books, 40 books for you, 40 books for you. You got 40 books. Go and appeal to whatever demographic you want to do. Go, go, go wherever you're going to go. You know, you can help. We're going to call this universe A, universe B. The two universes will not meet together. If uh, one universe gets a really good idea going, the other universe can take it and adapt it into theirs. If, uh, you know, universe B that's trying to appeal to new people, you create Ironheart and everybody loves her over there, then uh, the other universe, a collector aimed universe, can certainly take the character and introduce her just like we did the ultimate line and the, the regular mainstream line. Certainly do that. But um, they're never going to cross over. So, you know, universe B... You do whatever crazy shit you want. You want to make uh, Spider-Man black, you can go for it. You want to make Mr. Fantastic into a disabled lesbian, you can do that. Whatever you, whatever you, you do whatever you want. And Universe A, you're stuck with what you got. So, you know, go find creators, figure out who can, uh, who wants to work in each group. Both of you have a budget. You know, the targets for Group A, keep the audience. Targets for Group B, Show growth in the new audience. And uh, may the best man win. And ideally, both of you are successful. And, uh, you know, if you're really successful, we'll give you a little bit more budget. You can put out 50 books each a month. I, what do we care? That's probably the way you do it. Anyway, food for thought. Thanks for listening.